Hi guys, Dane here, and welcome to Bookshelf Tour, part number 21. So, without further ado, let's just get started, I guess. So, we'll start with John McAnally, Infinity Drake, The Sons of Scarlatti, and this is basically like a YA story, almost reminiscent of um, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, because basically this kid gets shrunk down uh, to take down some sort of evil wasps, basically. In fact, let me read the blurb. Infinity Drake and his scientist uncle are summoned to a crisis meeting. A power-mad villain has released a doomsday bioweapon, the mutant Scarlatti Wasp. Millions of lives are in danger, but Uncle Al has a crazy plan. Soon he's shrinking a crack military team to take down the wasps, but a double agent throws the mission and now Finn is 9mm tall and has the weight of the world's survival on its tiny shoulders. Killer bugs, it's time to pick on someone your own size. Really enjoyed it, actually. Uh, coming from someone who doesn't read much YA, I thought it was pretty good. Okay, then we have The Future Workplace Experience by Gene C. Meister and Kevin J. Mulcahy. This is one that I read for the client who pays me to write 2,000 word summaries of books. It was all right. It's a fairly generic business book. 10 rules for mastering disruption in recruiting and engaging employees. And the fact that this was 10 rules made it a lot easier for me to do these notes as well. But um, that's not necessarily a reason to read it. Here we have An Unbecoming Fit of Frenzy by Bruce McRae. Uh, this is poetry, so I'll read you some. Cometh the hour. Can't you sense it, son of a bitch? Something is coming over the fields. Something approaches us on its stomach. Some say it's winter or an army of snow. Some suggest a muted messenger. Everyone nods when death is mentioned. It's marching out of the seventh level, dragging a chain, a bad foot, a giant's head. It flies out from the valleys of reason. My sweetest demons prattling in their beds. All my soft monsters despairing. The sun blighted, the air scoured. But it's only the rain, an optimist declares. Schools darken, our churches condemned. It's only the plague of our indifference. Uh, I quite enjoyed that. I must admit, I don't remember this book too well, but that's made me want to reread it just because it's bleak and I like bleak poetry and bleak fiction and non-fiction for that matter. Here we have The Alchemist Mind, a book of narrative prose by poets edited by David Miller, published by Reality Street. I wouldn't recommend it because it's just like long, basically. It's quite experimental poetry. However, uh, I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but basically Reality Street, they allow people to support the press. And I used to be one of the supporters. You can't see that. Anyway, Dane Cobain is on that list. Uh, so I paid like a flat yearly fee and received some books for free. But then I stopped because it was too experimental, you know? I, I liked that poets were experimenting with that kind of stuff, but it didn't necessarily make it enjoyable to read. Uh, here we have Spike Milligan, Adolf Hitler, my part in his downfall. And basically it's about Spike Milligan's time during the Second World War. It's got lots of his uh, little cartoons in it, I believe. Not cartoons, like illustrations. Yeah, and uh, that probably won't pick up on the camera, but I will be able to show you some of these photos that, that are in there. Uh, yeah, this was 30 pence when it was first published, which in modern money is like 50 cents. Published in 1971. This is the 1973 reprint. And yeah, it was good. I enjoyed it. I've got some more Spike Milligan on my TBR. I also have this, Unspun Socks from a Chicken's Laundry. These are children's poems. Let's read you on. Poetry. I remember a tree upon a hill. If it stood there then, does it stand there still? If it doesn't stand still and moves about, then open the gates and let it out. And that was written in Hobart, Tasmania, 29th of April, 1980. The only thing I would say is this is kind of a sign of the times. In fact, it's a bit weird because it was written in the 80s, but there's a lot of like homophobia and sort of colonialist, colonialist sort of outlooks. And I think it's just because Milligan was born kind of, well, obviously, if he was serving during the, the Second World War, he was born in what, the 20s? Hey, Google, when was Spike Milligan born? Spike Milligan was born on the 16th of April 1918. Oh, there we go. He was born during the First World War then. Here we have Rage by Zygmunt Milosevsky, and uh, this is an advanced review copy from, I think, of a Polish author. And this was like a crime review book. I don't really remember it, to be honest. Um, yeah, I picked it up because apparently it sold loads of copies in the native language, and so it was getting quite well known, but. I wasn't really into it, to be honest. Here we have A.A. Milne, The Red House Mystery. So A.A. Milne wrote Winnie the Pooh. This is his only mystery novel. And actually, it was all right. My uh, my uncles read this and absolutely hated it. But I thought it was okay. It was like a 3 or 3.5. Um, yeah, 
I'm not going to go too far into it. And it, it does, like, it's very heavily influenced by, like, Sherlock Holmes and stuff. Here we have John Milton, Paradise Lost. Uh, I don't think I need to read you any of Par Paradise Lost, really. It's kind of the, the tale of, the, of Adam and Eve and the serpent and uh, man's fall from grace from the Garden of Eden. Here we have a Miracle, the Cage Issue, Owning Your Creativity. So this is a literary magazine, and I believe I'm probably in it. Yeah, I am in it. Cool. Let me see. It's quite cool. It's got a nice interior design as well. So this has got a poem of mine called Data Loss. This is years old. This is from, like, predates Eyes Like Lighthouses, uh, When the Boats Come Home, which is my poetry collection. You want to drive a man crazy, format his hard drive. We are all one and this datum surrounds and defines us. We are one hive mind that bows to insane demands. Destroy every shred of evidence a man ever lived and he is truly gone forever. Never trust writers who burn journals because books are sure to follow and men follow books and gods follow men. And I am all for music and love and rock and roll and all my friends are friendly. The generation pouring more data into the world every two days than was created until 2008. We define our own futures. This is only the beginning. There we go, old poetry. You are welcome. Here we have David Mitchell, Cloud Atlas. Uh, yeah, that's the only David Mitchell novel that I've read. I enjoyed it. It was pretty good. Uh, the movie was also all right. I actually enjoyed the movie more because I think I could follow it more, I guess. But it's not really my kind of book, but I enjoyed it for what it was. Then we have the other David Mitchell, the comedian David Mitchell. Thinking about it only makes it worse. And other lessons from modern life. This is like humorous nonfiction and all about adulting basically from Mitchell is in Mitchell and Webb yeah recommend it definitely and speaking of Mitchell and Webb we have this Mitchell and Webb book which is uh, yeah like just their humor it's quite visual as well uh, but there are also some like smoke less when you're pregnant <laughs> the following page is a to cater for fans of the mighty Boosh who have been bought this book as a present by mistake <laughs> just yeah humorous humorous humor all right, here we have Moby, uh, as in the musician, with me and Park. Gristle from Factory Farms to Food Safety. Thinking twice about the meat we eat. And this is just a short thing, basically, about meat production that I read for my book called Meat as well. And what's cool about this is it's got all different people. It's got, like, Lauren Bush here. Is, uh, and uh, Michael Gregor, MD, as well, who's kind of very influential plant-based doctor. But uh, the contents cover the different reasons against meat production, basically. So we've got health, environment, taxpayers, animals, climate change, children's health, workers, communities, zoonotic diseases and global hunger. And yeah, I recommend this one if you if you want to learn more about meat production, but you don't want to read like a massive tomb, you know. Here we have Michael Moore, stupid white men and other sorry excuses for the state of the nation. American politics, you probably don't really want to read this unless you're American. And also you'd want to be left leaning, I, I would have thought, to... Uh, to, to appreciate this one. I don't know, there's something about Michael Moore. I don't really like him, but I'm interested in what he has to say, I guess. Here we have Mothering Through Bipolar by Rebecca Moore, and uh, she was one of my good friends from Book Trope. I haven't spoken to her for ages, actually. I should follow up with her and see how she's doing. Um, but yeah, Book Trope was the publisher that first picked up some of my books. Uh, this is non-fiction and it's all about her journey as a parent while suffering from uh, bipolar disorder. Here we have the employee experience advantage, how to win the war for talent by giving employees the workspaces that they want, the tools they need and a culture they can celebrate by Jacob Morgan. This is another one of those that I wrote the summaries for for my client. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but yeah, I think this was the first one I did actually. Here we have The Night Circus by Erin Morgenstern. Controversial opinion, I didn't really like it very much. The uh, Some of the writing was pretty good, but I, I just thought it was a really good concept and I thought the execution wasn't great and I thought it was a shame. But I do know a lot of people really love The, the Night Circus as well. And it's sort of magical realism about a circus. Here we have The Universe Wide Web, a sci-fi adventure by Simon J. Morley. Uh, another review copy I was sent. <laughs> you can kind of tell from the cover art and the title, it's a bit... Not like it's not great, I guess, but it's not awful either. I mean, I read it, so there's that. Here we have Michael Moore Pergo, an eagle in the snow. I actually don't remember reading this one. That's pretty bad. I do remember reading this one though, War Horse. War Horse is obviously his famous one, and um, yeah, it's been turned into a musical, I think, or at least a theatre, a stage show. I'd like to see, and uh, it's interesting because the narrative voice is is the horse, effectively. And uh, yeah, it was all right. I, it wasn't as good as I was expecting, though. I actually think, I don't know. I wasn't convinced that using the narrative voice of the horse actually worked, but hey-ho. 
Here we have a very cool one. This is uh, The Lords and the New Creatures, the unpublished poetry of Jim Morrison. So I'll read you some. And also it's in this like acid yellow and acid green colours. Let's go for some acid yellow. In fact, it doesn't actually have titles, so I'll just read some bits. Urging to come to terms with the outside by absorbing, interiorising it. I won't come out, you must come into me. Into my womb garden where I peer out. Where I can construct a universe within the skull to rival the real. She said, your eyes are always black. The pupil opens to seize the object of vision. Imagery is born of loss. Loss of the friendly expanses. The breast is removed and the face imposes its cold, curious, forceful and inscrutable presence. You may enjoy life from afar. You may look at things but not taste them. You may caress the mother only with the eyes. You cannot touch these phantoms. There you go. It's just a cool little artifact to have. And then here I have Dinosaur Adventure by Tom Mosey. And I'll link to a tag I did ages ago below where I read this in full. And uh, basically this is uh, one of those books that's customised to tell the story of the reader. So this actually has my old surname before I change my name. The star of this book is Dane Bygrave with love from Grandma and Granddad 1992. Uh, Dane Bygrave, age three, lives in Dostil, which I used to. One day he decided he would like to see a real live dinosaur. There are no dinosaurs left in the world, Emily and Chris told him. So these are my half brother and half sister. It's very cool. Like I say, I did a full reading of that, which I will link to below. Okay, here we have Andrew Motion, selected poems 1976 to 1997. He was appointed Poet Laureate in May 1999, and I saw this going at a book sale, so I thought I'd pick it up. Again, I will read you a poem. Let's read you, trying to find one that's short. The Letter. All right, uh, actually, you know, we'll read this one. Anne Frankhaus, well, Hoos uh, in Dutch. Even now, after twice her lifetime of grief and anger in the very place, whoever comes to climb these narrow stairs discovers how the bookcase slides aside, then walks through shadow into sunlit rooms, can never help but break her secrecy again. Just listening is a kind of guilt. The Wester Kirk repeats itself outside, as if all time worked round towards her fear and made each stroke die down on guarded streets. Imagine it. Three years of whispering and loneliness and plotting day by day, the allied line in Europe with a yellow chalk. What hope she had for ordinary love and interest survives her here, displayed above the bed. As pictures of her family, some actors, fashions chosen by Princess Elizabeth, and those who stoop to see them find, not only patience missing its reward, but one enduring wish for chances, like my own. To leave as simply as I do, and walk at ease up dusty tree-lined avenues, or watch a silent barge come clear of bridges, settling their reflections in the blue canal. There we go. Alright, then we have Haruki Murakami in Norwegian Wood. Apparently it's the only Murakami I've read. I have also read like some of his short stories as well. In fact, I've also read what I talk about when I talk about running. Here it is. I don't know what that's doing over here. Because this is out of order. Why is it out of order? Oh well, it's out of order anyway. Uh, both excellent books. I'd probably prefer what I talk about when I talk about running more. I read that recently. So basically Murakami, when he was about my age now, he quit his job as a landlord of a pub, quit smoking, started running and tried to become a writer. So there was a lot for me to sort of think about there. And uh, yeah, would recommend, would recommend. But before those come Michael G. Munn's Zeus is Dead, A Monstrously Inconvenient Adventure and Myth Connections, a short story collection of classical myth in the modern world. And basically, these are both, um, they're like a mixture between, say, the Percy Jackson books and Douglas Adams it, and Terry Pratchett a bit as well. Basically, it's kind of comedic fantasy set in our world about what would happen if uh, the, the, the Greek gods were... We're still knocking around. So they're using Twitter and stuff. It's great. And he's an indie writer as well. So yeah, check that out. All right, then we have Leave Me Alone, Morong. And uh, this is... So I'm going to read the blurb of this because it will give, give you a better idea of it than I could give you. But it was very good. Would recommend. Leave Me Alone is an unflinching, darkly funny take on love and life in modern China. It's the story of three young men. Chen Zong, Li Liang, and Big Head Wang, and their tragic comic struggles to make their way in Chengdu, China's fifth most populous city. Despite their aspirations in the newly capitalist China, the trio's lives are beset by dead-end jobs, gambling debts, drinking, drugs, and whoring. So yeah, Chinese Bukowski. All right, and then here we have Pamela Miles and Roz Shafran, the CBT handbook. Basically, this is supposed to teach you how to do CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. It's really good for mental health problems and other issues. Uh, I've never found CBT really to help me, but that said, this is 
pretty much the definitive book on the subject as far as I'm concerned. So if you're interested in CBT, give that a go. All right, here we have Beyond Viral, How to Attract Customers, Promote Your Brand and Make Money with Online Video by Kevin Nouts, uh, Kevin H. Nouty. Uh, so sorry, Nouts is his YouTube channel. And he was one of like the original YouTubers back in like 2006. So he has like 230 something subscribers. And uh, yeah, I interviewed him after uh, uh, for this, after reading this as well for my old work. And yeah, he's a nice guy and a really good book. Probably worth reading if you're watching this and you make butchy videos. Here we have John Norton from Gutenberg to Zuckerberg. What you really need to know about the internet. A little bit outdated now, I guess, but John Norton's very well respected. I also got this super cheap for like 99p, I think. And uh, yeah, just some really interesting stuff about the internet and how it works and how it changes our brains. All right, then we have a bunch of Red Dwarf books. So this is by Grant Naylor. It's actually uh, Rob Grant and Doug Naylor, the two creators of the sort of cult sci-fi show Red Dwarf, which I'm a big fan of. So we have Better Than Life, which isn't really anything like the episode. I mean, it takes some of the concepts. Basically, Better Than Life is like a VR game where all of your sort of deepest fantasies come true. But the problem is, is it becomes addictive because you never want to leave and then your body kind of wastes away. Uh, here we have Infinity Welcomes Careful Drivers, which is another one of the uh, Red Dwarf books. When Lister got drunk, he really got drunk. After celebrating his birthday with a Monopoly board pub crawl around London, he came, in a bur he came to in a burger bar in one of Saturn's moons, wearing a ladies' print crimpoline hat and a pair of yellow and fishnet waders with no money and a passport in the name of Ellie Emily Birkenstein. Wow, I uh, cocked reading that up, but oh well. Here we have uh, Primordial Soup and Son of Soup. So these are basically script collections from the show. Here we have uh, Red Dwarf, the making of Red Dwarf. Sorry, and uh, yeah, this is mostly about season six and uh, they did a famous episode called Gunmen of the Apocalypse. So that's featured quite heavily in here. We have like scripts and behind the scenes stuff and like photos and yeah, really cool. I got these from a car boot sale actually. Then we have Patrick Ness, A Monster Calls. Unfortunately, I wasn't the biggest fan of this. I just sort of felt... I don't tend to enjoy books where the author is deliberately exploiting your emotions. Like, and I could... Because I was just reading it and I was like spotting it, spotting it happening, if that makes sense. But I know a lot of people do love it. And yeah, I'm, I suppose it was all right. It was like a three out of five for me. And finally, last book of this tour, we have uh, New Scientists, Question Everything. Uh, and yeah, this is a, a book of like sort of philosophy, I guess, and people sending questions like Gerald Leach. Oxygen has a slightly greater density than nitrogen. Why don't these main constituents of air separate out? And then you have like scientific scientific answers to them. So yeah, that's it for this episode of the uh, bookshelf tour. As you can see, we're now into the ends, and uh, yeah, we're making good good progress. So. Uh, yeah, I'll love you and leave you for now. So thanks as always for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and if so, what you thought of them. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.